Chapter 8. Work for the Dead. The temples of the Mormons are different from any other temples in the world. The ordinance work being done in them is foreign to all other churches, yet it is in agreement with the doctrine and teachings of Paul the Apostle. For example, they baptized for the dead in Paul's time, and they have been baptizing for the dead ever since Joseph Smith's time. It is not just an important doctrine, but is essential for the salvation of mankind. Joseph Fielding Smith, Way to Perfection pages 161 to 162. There was no work done for the dead in the days of Elijah, nor in those of any of the other ancient prophets. This work could not be performed until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who opened the door to those who were bound. The Savior first took the message of salvation to the dead, and after his resurrection, the blessings of the gospel were extended to the dead as well as to the living, for it was the atonement and resurrection of Jesus Christ that made this possible. When, therefore, the keys of the sealing power which Elijah brought to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were delivered, power was given to extend this authority to all who now live on the earth, and to all who have lived in the past who will repent and receive the gospel. I Corinthians 15 29. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Joseph Smith, TPJS, page 179. I presume the doctrine of baptism for the dead has ere this reached your ears, and may have raised some inquiries in your minds respecting the same. I cannot in this letter give you all the information you may desire on the subject, but aside from knowledge independent of the Bible, I would say that it was certainly practiced by the ancient churches, and St. Paul endeavors to prove the doctrine of the resurrection from the same, and says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? I first mentioned the doctrine in public when preaching the funeral sermon of Brother Seymour Brunson, and have since then given general instructions in the church on the subject. The saints have the privilege of being baptized for those of their relatives who are dead, whom they believe would have embraced the gospel, if they had been privileged with hearing it, and who have received the gospel in the Spirit, through the instrumentality of those who have been commissioned to preach to them while in prison. Joseph Smith, TPJS, page 12. But except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This eternal truth settles the question of all men's religion. A man may be saved, after the judgment, in the terrestrial kingdom, or in the telestyle kingdom, but he can never see the celestial kingdom of God, without being born of water and the Spirit. He may receive a glory like unto the moon, i.e., of which the light of the moon is typical, or a star, i.e., of which the light of the stars is typical. Dot, dot, dot. Brigham Young J.D. 9315. It may be asked whether any person can be saved, except those who are baptized. Yes, all the inhabitants of the earth will be saved, except those that sin against the Holy Ghost. Will they come into the presence of the Father and the Son? No, unless they are baptized for the remission of sins, and live faithfully in the observance of the words of life, all the rest of their days. Orson Pratt. J.D. 1852. Do you suppose that the Lord has made no provision for all these things? All must have a chance. There is not an individual that ever lived upon the earth, from the days of Adam down to this time, whether it was among the heathen or savages, who never heard of Jesus or of the true God, and who went down to his grave in total ignorance, there never was a man or woman on the face of the globe. But what will have an opportunity, either in this life or in the life to come, to obey and enjoy the benefits of the gospel of salvation? But did you not say that there was no opportunity for them to attend to these ordinances in the life to come? I did. Then why did you say that there will be an opportunity for them? There is quite a difference between having an opportunity and attending to the ordinances. You cannot attend to the latter in the life to come. Parties who have died in this generation or in the generations past, without having an opportunity to be baptized by a man holding authority, will have an opportunity of hearing the gospel in the life to come, but they cannot attend personally to the ordinances thereof. Why? Because God has ordained that men, here in the flesh, shall be baptized in this life, or, if they die without a knowledge of the gospel and its ordinances, that their friends in the flesh, in the day of his power, when he brings forth the everlasting gospel, shall officiate for them, and in their behalf. This is another peculiarity of the doctrine of the Latter-day Saints' baptism for the dead. Joseph Smith, Contributor 4 175. My text is on the resurrection of the dead, which you will find in the fourteenth chapter of John. In my Father's house are many mansions. It should be, in my Father's kingdom are many kingdoms in order that ye may be heirs of God and joint heirs with me.
There are many mansions for those who obey a celestial law, and there are other mansions for those who come short of the law, every man in his own order. There is baptism, etc., for those to exercise who are alive, and baptism for the dead, who died without the knowledge of the gospel. In regard to the law of the priesthood, there should be a place where all nations shall come up from time to time to receive their endowments, and the Lord has said this shall be the place for the baptism for the dead. Every man that has been baptized and belongs to the kingdom has a right to be baptized for those who are gone before, and, as soon as the law of the gospel is obeyed here by their friends who act as proxy for them, the Lord has administrators there to set them free. A man may act as proxy for his own relatives. The ordinances of the gospel which were laid out before the foundation of the world have thus been fulfilled by them, and we may be baptized for those whom we have much friendship for, but it must first be revealed to the man of God, lest we should run too far. Charles W. Penrose, J.D. 2496-97. But these ordinances belong to the sphere in which we live, they belong to the earth, they belong to the flesh. Water is an earthly element compassed of two gases. It belongs to this earth. What there is in the spirit world, we know little about. But here is the water in which repentant believers must be baptized. Can they be baptized in the spirit world? It appears not. What is to be done, then? The Apostle Paul asks this question in the 15th chapter of the first epistle of the Corinthians. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? It seems that the people to whom that was written were familiar with the ordinance called baptism for the dead, and they were baptized for their dead. Paul was arguing upon the literal resurrection of the body, and says, What shall they do if the dead rise not? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Our learned divines may presume from that that the doctrine is not laid down sufficiently clear to endorse it, but to us there is no doubt concerning it, the Lord having revealed the principle to the prophet Joseph Smith. He also explained the manner in which the ordinances should be administered, like everything else he has revealed, in great plainness. And that is why we are building temples. People who visit our city frequently say, what a fine meeting house you are building. No, that is not a meeting house, this assembly hall and the adjacent tabernacle are meeting houses. That is a temple, a building in which we expect to perform ordinances for the living and the dead, wherein we may be baptized for our dead, that they may receive the benefit of that ordinance, provided they believe and repent and do the spiritual part, while we do the material part, that they may receive the blessings of obedience to the gospel, and live according to God and the Spirit. Some will say, I cannot see why a thing done by one person should stand for another. How do you understand the doctrine that Jesus Christ has done something for all of us? We read that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. Not my blood or your blood is to be shed for the remission of our sins, but he who is without sin allowed his blood to be shed as a sacrifice for our sins. Now the whole question hinges on that. If you reject the doctrine of proxy and baptism, you must reject the doctrine of proxy and the atonement. Wilford Woodruff, J.D. 1928-229 I look upon this portion of our ministry as a mission of as much importance as preaching to the living. The dead will hear the voice of the servants of God in the spirit world, and they cannot come forth in the morning of the resurrection, unless certain ordinances are performed, for and in their behalf, in temples built to the name of God. It takes just as much to save a dead man as a living man. For the last 1800 years, the people that have lived and passed away never heard the voice of an inspired man, never heard a gospel sermon, until they entered the spirit world. Somebody has got to redeem them by performing such ordinances for them in the flesh as they cannot attend to themselves in the spirit, and in order that this work may be done, we must have temples in which to do it, and what I wish to say to you, my brethren and sisters, is that the God of heaven requires us to rise up and build them, that the work of redemption may be hastened. Our reward will meet us when we go behind the veil. The dead will be after you, they will seek after you as they have after us in St. George. They called upon us, knowing that we held the keys and power to redeem them. I will here say, before closing, that two weeks before I left St. George, the spirits of the dead gathered around me, wanting to know why we did not redeem them. Said they, you have had the use of the endowment house for a number of years, and yet nothing has ever been done for us. We laid the foundation of the government you now enjoy, and we never apostatized from it, but we remained true to it, and were faithful to God. These were the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and they waited on me for two days and two nights. I thought it very singular, that notwithstanding so much work had been done, and yet nothing had been done for them. 
The thought never entered my heart, from the fact, I suppose, that heretofore our minds were reaching after our more immediate friends and relatives. I straightway went into the baptismal font and called upon Brother McAllister to baptize me for the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and fifty other eminent men, making one hundred in all, including John Wesley, Columbus, and others, I then baptized him for every President of the United States, except three, and when their cause is just, somebody will do the work for them. Horatio Pickett a vision given on March 19, 1914, as recorded in the vision, by N. B. Lunwall, pages 142 to 143. Do the departed appreciate vicarious work performed for them? While working here in the St. George Temple, I often thought of the great expense and the time and labor necessary to support the temple, and to perform the necessary ordinances therein for the salvation of the dead, and the question often arose in my mind. Do they, the dead, know what is being done for them, and do they appreciate the sacrifice that is being made by their brethren and sisters in the temples for their benefit? I often ask the Lord to give me sufficient of His Spirit, that I might have a better understanding of the temple work than I had, one day while at the font confirming, when a large list of women were being baptized for, the thought again came into my mind, do those people for whom this work is being done, know that it is being done for them, and, if they do, do they appreciate it? While the thought was running through my mind I happened to turn my eyes toward the southeast corner of the fond room, and there I saw a large group of women. The whole southeast part of the room was filled, they seemed to be standing a foot or more above the floor, and were all intently watching the baptizing that was being done, and as the recorder called a name, one of them a rather tall, very slim woman, apparently about thirty-five years of age, gave a sudden start and looked at the recorder. Then her eyes turned to the couple in the water, closely watching the baptism, then her eyes followed the sister that was being baptized as she came up out of the water and was confirmed, and when the ordinance was completed, the happy joyous expression that spread over her countenance was lovely to behold. The next one called seemed to be a younger woman, a little below the average height. She was of a nervous emotional nature, could not keep still, seemed as though she wanted to jump into the water herself, and when the ordinance was finished, she seemed to be overflowing with joy, turning from one to another of her companions, as though she was telling them how happy she was. The third was a large muscular-looking woman, not fleshy but bony, masculine build, very high forehead and intelligent countenance, hair streaked with grey and comb-like elderly ladies used to wear their hair when I was a lad. She seemed to be of a more quiet, stoical nature than the others, no outward demonstration of what her feelings may have been, but there was a look in her eyes that seemed to say that she appreciated what was being done fully as much as the others did, and when the ceremony was finished, she nodded her head slightly and moved her lips, as though she might have said, Amen. Just as the work for her was finished, there was a noise in President Cannon's office, as though a book or something might have fallen to the floor which caused me to turn my eyes in that direction, and though I turned back instantly, the vision had faded and gone, and with it also had gone all doubt and queries that may have been in mind on the subject. I was satisfied, and am still satisfied that our friends behind the veil know and realize what is being done for them, and are anxiously waiting for their time to come. I do not think it would be possible for any person to look into the faces of those women as I did, and see the earnestness with which they were watching the proceedings, and the joy and happiness that shone in their faces as their names were called and the work done for them, and not feel as I do. This was not a night vision nor a dream, but was about three o'clock on a bright sunny afternoon, while I was standing at the font assisting in the ordinances thereof. Orson Pratt, J.D. 21-293-294 but this opens up another field, I am talking to some who have a second wife. You lost your first wife, did you not, and you remarried according to the laws of the nations? What about these two wives? One living and the other dead, perhaps the dead one was just as good as the living, perhaps the person that died, before you gathered here to these mountains, was morally as good as any latter-day saint, lived up to all the light and knowledge which she was in possession of, yet she was not married to you by divine authority what of her, must she stand aside in the resurrection? And the second wife, because she happens to live and to receive the gospel, and to gather up from among the nations, into the mountains, where the authority to administer these ordinances reveal must, she supplant the first one that happened to fall into her grave before she heard these things. Must the first one remain without her family, without her children, according to the order that exists in the eternal world, while the second one enjoys all these things because she happened to live a little longer? What do you think about it? Are there no provisions made for the first wife that has fallen asleep just as much as there is for the second? 
for God is without respect of persons, so far as people are honest and obedient, and though people may fail to receive the fullness of the blessings pertaining to the gospel, because it might not be sent to them and they fall asleep, yet God was not so short-sighted in laying of the plan of salvation that he made no provisions for them. He did make provisions for them, and in what way? That the living shall act for the dead, this is the provision. Hence, we read concerning one of the sacred and holy ordinances, called baptism, that the saints in the Corinthian church, in ancient times, were baptized for those that were dead. What was the object of this? The object was that eternal blessings might be bestowed upon those who were dead, because of the actions of the living in their behalf, providing that the dead would receive what was done for them by the living. The same great being that ordained the principle of baptism for and in behalf of the dead, also ordained eternal union through other sacred ordinances, referring to the man and the woman, not only for the living, but also for the dead, that they might be benefited not only by the actions of the living in baptism, but also by the acts of the living in relation to the marriage covenant. One is just as consistent as the other. If there is any great principle that has a bearing upon the eternal welfare of the human family, any great ordinance necessary to be attended to that will give them a right entitled to eternal blessings, it matters not whether it be baptism, or the laying on of hands, or any other ordinance which God has instituted. They will be recognized in the eternal heavens. Joseph Smith, TPJS, page 356. What promises are made in relation to the subject of the salvation of the dead? And what kind of characters are those who can be saved, although their bodies are moldering and decaying in the grave? When his commandments teach us, it is in view of eternity, for we are looked upon by God as though we were in eternity. God dwells in eternity, and does not view things as we do. The greatest responsibility in this world that God has laid upon us is to seek after our dead. The Apostle says, they without us cannot be made perfect. Hebrews 11:40. For it is necessary that the sealing power should be in our hands to seal our children and our dead, for the fullness of the dispensation of times a dispensation, to meet the promises made by Jesus Christ, before the foundation of the world for the salvation of man. Joseph Fielding Smith, Way to Perfection, pages 322-323. Our Savior said that a man cannot enter the kingdom unless he is born of the water and of the Spirit. In order that all may have this privilege, if they will accept it, provision has been made to carry the gospel to the dead where it is taught to them. It has also been decreed that ordinance work, which pertains to this mortal life, shall be performed for them in the temples of the Lord by those now living. It has been decreed that man must do for himself what he is able to do, but what he cannot do for himself, others may do for him. That is why Jesus Christ became our Redeemer. In a less capacity we may be saviors to others by doing for them in the temples what they cannot do for themselves and what we can do for them. It is very clear that there is neither time nor information at hand to enable the saints who are comparatively few in number to finish the ordinance work for the dead before the coming of Jesus Christ. It is expected, however, that we do all that we possibly can for them, as the information is placed in our hands. However, we can easily understand that the greater part of this work of salvation for the dead must be performed after the millennium is ushered in. Brigham Young. Discourses, page 616, 619, 628, as quoted in Way to Perfection, pages 323, 325 to 326, 324. The Christian world have taught, preached, contemplated, meditated, sung about and prayed for the millennium. What are you going to do during that period, Christians? Do you know what the millennium is for, and what work will have to be done during that period? Suppose the Christian world were now one in heart, faith, sentiment and works, so that the Lord could commence the millennium in power and glory, do you know what would be done? Would you sit and sing yourselves away to everlasting bliss? No, I reckon not. I think there is a work to be done then which the whole world seems determined we shall not do. What is it? To build temples and work for the salvation of our forefathers. Page 616. We shall go forth in the name of Israel's God and attend to the ordinances for them, the dead, and through the millennium, the thousand years that the people will love and serve God, we will build temples and officiate therein for those who have slept for hundreds and thousands of years, those who would have received the truth if they had had the opportunity, and we will bring them up, and form the chain entire, back to Adam. If we preserve ourselves in the truth and live so that we shall be worthy of the celestial kingdom, by and by we can officiate for those who have died without the gospel the honest, honorable, truthful, virtuous and pure. 
by and by it will be set unto us, Go ye forth and be baptized for them, and receive the ordinances for them, and the hearts of the children will be turned to the fathers who have slept in their graves, and they will secure to them eternal life. This must be, lest the Lord come and smite the earth with a curse. Page 619 during the millennium, a great many of the elders of Israel and Mount Zion will become pillars in the temple of God, to go no more out. They will eat and drink and sleep there, and they will often have occasion to say, Somebody came to the temple last night, we did not know who he was, but he was no doubt a brother, and told us a great many things we did not before understand. He gave us the names of a great many of our forefathers that are not on record, and he gave me my true lineage and names of my forefathers for hundreds of years back. He said to me, You and I are connected in one family. There are the names of your ancestors, take them and write them down, and be baptized and confirmed, and save such ones, and receive of the blessings of the eternal priesthood for such and such an individual, as you do for yourselves. This is what we are going to do for the inhabitants of the earth. When I look at it, I do not want to rest a great deal, but be industrious all the day along, for when we come to think upon it, we have no time to lose, for it is a pretty laborious work. Page 628. Brigham Young. J.D. 9317. Many inquiries are made as to what will become of that portion of the world of mankind who have died without law. When we return to build up the waste places of Zion, then will the scripture be fulfilled him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. The servants of God will officiate for the dead in the temples of God which will be built. The gospel is now preached to the spirits in prison, and when the time comes for the servants of God to officiate for them, the names of those who have received the gospel in the spirit will be revealed by the angels of God, and the spirits of just men made perfect, also the places of their birth, the age in which they lived, and everything regarding them that is necessary to be recorded on earth. And they will then be saved so as to find admittance into the presence of God, with their relatives who have officiated for them. The wicked will be cleansed and purified as by fire, some of them will be saved as by fire. Some will be given over to the buffering of Satan, that their spirits may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Others will receive their bodies, but cannot be saved in the kingdoms and mansions that are in the presence of God. All the children of men will receive a glory in the mansions of God according to their capacities, and rewards according to their acts in the flesh. Brigham Young, J.D.A. 225. Our bodies are now mortal. In the resurrection there will be a reunion of the spirits and bodies, and they will walk, talk, eat, drink, and enjoy. Those who have passed these ordeals are society for angels for the gods, and are the ones who will come into the temple of the Lord, that is to be built in the latter days, when saviors shall come up upon Mount Zion, and will say, Here, my children, I want this and this done. Here are the names of such and such ones, of our fathers and mothers our ancestors, we will bring them up. Go forth, you who have not passed the ordeals of death and the resurrection you who live in the flesh, and attend to the ordinances for those who have died without the law. Those who are resurrected will thus dictate in the temple. When the saints pass through death, they cannot officiate in this sinful world, but they will dictate those who are here. Go, now, and be baptized for the honorable for, those who would have received the law of God and the true religion, if they had lived, be baptized for the heathen for all who were honest, officiate for them, and save them, and bring them up, be baptized for them, anointed for them, washed and sealed for them, and fulfill all the ordinances which cannot be dispensed with. They will all be performed for the living and the dead upon Mount Zion. Brigham Young, J.D., 1536-137-139 Now a few words to the brethren and sisters upon the doctrine and ordinances of the house of God. All who have lived on the earth according to the best light they had, and would have received the fullness of the gospel had it been preached to them, are worthy of a glorious resurrection, and will attain to this by being administered for in the flesh by those who have the authority. All others will have a resurrection, and receive a glory, except those who have sinned against the Holy Ghost. It is supposed by this people that we have all the ordinances in our possession for life and salvation, and exaltation, and that we are administering in these ordinances. This is not the case. We are in possession of all the ordinances that can be administered in the flesh, but there are other ordinances and administrations that must be administered beyond this world. I know you would ask what they are. I will mention one. We have not, neither can we receive here, the ordinance and the keys of the resurrection. 
they will be given to those who have passed off the stage of action and have received their bodies again, as many have already done and many more will. They will be ordained by those who hold the keys of the resurrection to go forth and resurrect the saints, just as we receive the ordinance of baptism, then the keys of authority to baptize others for the remission of their sins. This is one of the ordinances we cannot receive here, and there are many more. We hold the authority to dispose of, alter and change the elements, but we have not received authority to organize native element to even make a spear of grass grow. We have no such ordinance here. We organize according to men in the flesh. By combining the elements and planting the seed, we cause vegetables, trees, grains, etc. to come forth. We are organizing a kingdom here according to the pattern that the Lord has given for people in the flesh, but not for those who have received the resurrection, although it is a similitude. Another item. We have not the power in the flesh to create and bring forth or produce a spirit, but we have the power to produce a temporal body. The germ of this, God is placed within us. And when our spirits receive our bodies, and through our faithfulness we are worthy to be crowned, we will then receive authority to produce both spirit and body. But these keys we cannot receive in the flesh. Herein, brethren, you can perceive that we have not finished, and cannot finish our work, while we live here, no more than Jesus did while he was in the flesh. We cannot receive while in the flesh, the keys to form and fashion kingdoms and to organize matter, for they are beyond our capacity and calling, beyond this world. In the resurrection, men who have been faithful and diligent in all things in the flesh, have kept their first and second estate, and are worthy to be crowned gods, even the sons of God, will be ordained to organize matter. If we ask who will stand at the head of the resurrection in this last dispensation, the answer is Joseph Smith Jr., the prophet of God. He is the man who will be resurrected and receive the keys of the resurrection, and he will seal this authority upon others, and they will hunt up their friends and resurrect them when they shall have been officiated for, and bring them up. And we will have revelations to know our forefathers clear back to Father Adam and Mother Eve, and we will enter into the temples of God and officiate for them. Then man will be sealed to man until the chain is made perfect back to Adam, so that there will be a perfect chain of priesthood from Adam to the winding up scene. Brigham Young J.D. 7289. Joseph Smith holds the keys of this last dispensation, and is now engaged behind the veil in the great work of the last days. I can tell our beloved brother Christians who have slain the prophets and butchered and otherwise caused the death of thousands of Latter-day Saints, the priests who have thanked God in their prayers and thanksgiving from the pulpit that we have been plundered, driven, and slain, and the deacons under the pulpit, and their brethren and sisters in their closets, who have thanked God, thinking that the Latter-day Saints were wasted away, something that no doubt will mortify them something that, to say the least, is a matter of deep regret to them namely, that no man or woman in this dispensation will ever enter into the celestial kingdom of God without the consent of Joseph Smith. From the day that the priesthood was taken from the earth to the winding up scene of all things, every man and woman must have the certificate of Joseph Smith, Jr., as a passport to their entrance into the mansion where God and Christ are I with you and you with me. I cannot go there without his consent. He holds the keys of that kingdom for the last dispensation the keys to rule in the spirit world, and he rules there triumphantly, for he gained full power and a glorious victory over the power of Satan while he was yet in the flesh, and was a martyr to his religion and to the name of Christ, which gives him a most perfect victory in the spirit world. He reigns there as supreme a being in his sphere, capacity, and calling, as God does in heaven. Many will exclaim, oh, that is very disagreeable. It is preposterous? We cannot bear the thought? but it is true. I will now tell you something that ought to comfort every man and woman on the face of the earth. Joseph Smith, Jr., will again be on this earth, dictating plans and calling for his brethren to be baptized for the very characters who wish this was not so, in order to bring them into a kingdom to enjoy, perhaps, the presence of angels or the spirits of good men. If they cannot endure the presence of the Father and the Son, and he will never cease his operations, under the directions of the Son of God, until the last ones of the children of men are saved that can be, from Adam till now. Should not this thought comfort all people? They will, by and by, be a thousand times more thankful for such a man as Joseph Smith, Jr., than it is possible for them to be for any earthly good whatever. It is his mission to see that all the children of men in this last dispensation are saved, that can be, through the redemption. You will be thankful, every one of you, that Joseph Smith, Jr., was ordained to this great calling before the worlds were.